Uh, welcome to the press conference on the new results from the International Ocean Discovery Program, or IODP for short, and the Past for Future Program. I will let Albergeads introduce the IODP speakers, and I'll briefly introduce the Past for Future speakers. Uh, so we have Dorte sitting there, the third. Uh, Dorte Daliensen, she's the project coordinator for Past for Future, and she's a researcher at the University of Copenhagen in Denmark. And Emily Capron is a paleoclimatology at the British Antarctic Survey in Cambridge in the UK. And I'll just uh, pass the microphone to Albert. Yeah, thank you very much, Barbara. Hi, everyone. My name is Albert Gerdes. I'm uh, doing outreach uh, together with my colleague Alan Stevenson, who is sitting uh, there at the end. Uh, for the uh, ECORT, European Consortium for Ocean Research Drilling. We um, are part of the IODP, as Barbara mentioned. IODP, International Ocean Discovery Program, is one of the major marine geoscientific research programs with the annual budget this year is about 200 million US dollars. Um, we Europeans uh, do specific um, expeditions. Uh, the recent, most recent one was in the Baltic Sea last uh, September with the offshore phase and uh, the onshore phase a little bit, little bit later. And Thomas Andreen uh, from uh, Sweden, um, Sudaturn University, he was one of the co-chief, uh, one of the two co-chiefs of this expedition. Um, along with him, we have Arno Kotilainen from the Finnish Geological Survey, and uh, he did um, sedimentology, I think it was, uh, for this expedition. Correlation. Correlation. And you were on the expedition, right? Yeah. Yeah. So he was offshore and onshore, and they will tell you about what happened uh, with this expedition. Okay, Thomas, go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, So, there we are. Yeah, I don't need to introduce myself. I was one of two crew chief scientists of Expedition 347, Baltic Sea Paleo Environment. The other co chief was Jörn Bo Jorgensen. Uh, no, not at all. Bo Barker Jorgensen from uh, Aarhus University. He's a microbiologist. And I am perhaps sedimentologist, stratigrapher, or at least a geologist. Uh, we core the Baltic Sea. And why? Well, the Baltic Sea is up there. And uh, why the Baltic Sea? First and foremost, because of its geographic location. It's located as co constituting a link between the Central Europe and the North Atlantic and the Greenland climatic records. Secondly, it has been exposed to several glaciations, meaning it has a long glacial history and also the Baltic Sea sediments have recorded the interglacials, the times between the glaciations. And it has a large catchment area, meaning that the surrounding area around the Baltic Basin, everything that happens there is recorded in the sediments in the Baltic Sea, one way or another. <coughs> Sorry. We, um, based on old seismic records, we uh, decided to core seven sites two in the southern part, in the Anholt area, and in the Honu Bay, uh, in the Little Belt, which uh, were we supposed to hope to collect the oldest sediments. Uh, in the southern Baltic Sea, in the Honu Bay and the Bornholm Basin, we hope to collect the sediments between the last interglacial, the Eemian, 130,000 years ago, and the onset of the last glaciation some 50,000 years ago. In the deepest part of the Baltic Sea, in the Lansort Deep, we hope to collect uh, the Holocene sediments, covering the last 11,500 years, and the absolute youngest sediments that constitutes a link to the present day up in the Ongerman Elven estuary. Uh, so we sailed with the great ship Manisha and Cord for almost two months uh, in the end of 2013, and we came home with one a lot of sediment that was opened on the onshore science party in January and February this year. And that was like Christmas for our, for us geologists. We opened the cores, we saw what we have cored, we documented it, and we also subsampled them. And some of us get a little carried away. This is 
Jonathan Warnock, a diatomalist that uh, realized that he could actually take a toothpick sample from each millimeter or two millimeter layers in that core. And he was one of the two scientists that won the competition most samples from one core and also the next competition most samples to one scientist. The other one was Eleanor, who also was a diametologist. Uh, some very, very preliminary results and what is easy to show is that from the little belt area we have evidence of a local ice lake drainage manifested in uh, glacial clay that abruptly transfers into converts into a sandy layer and on top of that we have an organic rich mud and that is probably a hiatus involved which means that we have several thousand of years of non sediment deposition. Intriguing and I will be further investigated. We have from the Lansut Deep a very long sequence of varved glacial clay from the Baltic Ice Lake stage and we probably have at least 500 years in that core, meaning that a very intriguing cold phase in the end of the last glacial called the Younger Dryas is probably covered in that core, the entire Younger Dryas, meaning that we have an annual record of the behavior of the Scandinavian ice sheet during that 1200 year long Younger Dryas period. That has, is intriguing for all geologists. And we also have from the youngest part, from the last 8,000 years or so, laminated jutia. Laminated means that it's striped, or I wouldn't say varred because I don't know if it's annual deposition, but assume it is. But we have a very high sedimentation rate, a few millimeters per year, so we will have a very, very good resolution in the youngest sediments, a resolution never achieved before in the Baltic Sea. Uh, so if that is, was the picture of our knowledge of the Baltic Sea and its connection to the world's climate system with small, clear spots. Hopefully, after the IODP expedition, we will have a much better picture, much clearer picture of the history of the Baltic Sea. And I was not alone. We were 31 scientists, and this is the science party photographed in, uh, during the onshore science party in Bremen. And that is actually my co-chief colleague, Bobarke Jorgensen. So, the research that just started and we'll for sh we'll, we will for sure never have a dull moment the coming years. Thank you very much for your attention. Ladies and gentlemen, from Thomas, overall presentation, me, we move a bit more in detail stuff, insight into Holocene climate and Baltic Sea Basin dynamics. Again, ongoing project, preliminary information on that. First of all, it's good to remember that Baltic Sea environmental state depends on several factors. Number one is meteorological forcing over the North Atlantic region. Then water cycle processes or hydrology is very important and the interaction between saline North Sea water inflow into the basin and freshwater um, discharge from river inflows are the crucial elements which we should know if we want to understand what's going on in the Baltic Sea. First of all, just a few words about inflow of um, saline water. That means that North Sea waters comes into the basin through the Dennis Straits and fill the basin. That's very crucial because those inflows are full of oxygen-rich water and those control the anoxic oxic conditions in the deep basins. So what, what do we know at this moment about those inflows? We have a pretty good information from instrumental data if we go back like in 100 years time and also from sediment archives, but sediment archives, we have detailed information just down to, let's say, 1,000 years. Here is the one example from new results showing around uh, one meter long sediment core from the Gotland Deep um, surface here, modern warm period, and deeper down we have uh, medieval climate anomaly. 
in the middle part you can see the black black line that shows the benthic foraminiferas, it's, which are small animals living in the water, and presence of, of those forums indicate those saline water inflows. And you can see over the past 1,000 or 800 years, uh, um, um, you can see nice variability. And if you look deeper in detail, you can see more inflows during climate transitions from the warm period to uh, cold period to, towards little ice age, as well as from the cold period towards modern day uh, situation. What does that mean? So saline water inflows increased during climatic transitions. Those are most probably linked uh, in the changes in the atmosphere, mainly in the uh, NAO, North Atlantic Oscillation Conditions, probably from more stable NAO phase towards unstable NAO phase. And as climate predictions uh, shows or indicate that um, in the future climate will warm, also in the Baltic Sea, sea surface temperatures will increase. That means we might have less inflows, salinity will decrease, and there will be a lot of changes in ecosystem. But still, it's important to remember that we still lack information. We, 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 lack, uh, we lack high resolution information as well as long time series about those. And another question mark is the precipitation. We really do not, do not know how the precipitation has changed over the past thousands of years. That's, that's an big, another big question mark. So in our expedition, recovered really nice um, high-resolution sediment records, as Thomas showed, and those will provide new information on, on, on saline water inflows, as well as the precipitation over the past thousands of years. And I have two examples, one, one from the southern Baltic and one from the northern Baltic. Here is the Lillebelt site, 59, uh, in the Dennis Straits. Uh, there we covered over 50 meters of Holocene mud. And that's very important to realize that it's very high resolution. Average sedimentation rate is around six, seven millimeters per year. That means that we can study in very detail those variability, was what we can see in the records. And potentially, high resolution record, not just saline water inflows, but also temperature records. In the right-hand side, you can see just the uh, measurements we did during onshore phase, that's magnetic susceptibility. Over the, yeah, here's the interval from zero down to 50 meters. So it's nice, no, nice variability, which, which means that there have been a lot of variability in the sediment and mineral uh, contained in those. And another picture from that side, preliminary results on diatom uh, analysis. Here's the upper 50 meters. And the main message here, you can see those uh, different species showing different environmental conditions, marine conditions, dark blue. So again, even it's a very low resolution data this, this far. So nice variability, which means when those guys who has picked up, like Thomas showed, like thousands of samples will cut their results. We will have really, really high resolution, let's say ultra high resolution record of climate variability. And the other record is from the Northern Baltic. See what I will show. It looks like it's inland. It's almost inland. It's Ongerman River estuary. There we recovered uh, approximately 15 meters of Holocene clays. Average sedimentary season rate is around one to two millimeters per year. But again, that will give nice record of precipitation and river runoff, which has not been done earlier on in the Baltic Sea. Um, results of studies, what has been done earlier on, shows that during the warm phases, we might have had a higher precipitation and river deserts, and we are really looking forward also to get into the detail in this site. So just to conclude, so IODP recovered really high resolution sediment records that provide new information about climate variability uh, of global importance, not just the variability, but also the factors what are behind of those changes. And this is for sure important for um, improved management, 
also this information is needed to implement policy strategies as well as as we want to adapt to future climate change. So work is just began, so it's in progress, so more in next year here. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Arno and Thomas. We decided to have the question answer session in the end, but if, uh, if there were any immediate uh, uh, question, we could, we could have that. Otherwise, we could continue with past for future. Yeah. Well, it was, uh, at being a Dane, it was nice to hear about your results uh, and, and know we have so much mud in Denmark. Um, <laughs> so thanks for that. <laughs> so um, I coordinate uh, one of the big uh, collaborative programs under the, the seventh framework program of the EU. It's called Past for Future. And the main idea of this program is to investigate uh, um, the climate of the past uh, in the warm climate periods and uh, see if we can understand the climate changes we observe in these periods and also try to assess the risk of abrupt changes in a warm climatic period. So the project uh, has 22 uh, partners, from, from the, mainly from the European Union, and uh, um, we've been working for four years. This is our last year. And uh, I'll just very briefly go through uh, some of the, the targets we've had. And then Emily will take a, a, a special a case and tell you a little more about that. So, um, yeah, I've basically told all these things. Uh, we do try to take uh, records from many different sources. Um, so we have, um, especially the ice cores has been a big uh, part of Past for Future because we've um, had uh, a, the new name ice core in Greenland. But we also have a lot of um, researchers working on marine cores, on spelter terms and pollens. And on top of that, uh, we try to combine the, the data part with, with models, uh, uh, so, so we use the data we get uh, to get our results. One, one thing um, that has turned out to be a, a big task of Past for Future is to date um, the, the records, because one of the, the reasons that it's been difficult to access what, wh why, why um, the changes have been in our Holocene, our, our warm periods, is that they, they are badly dated. And for that reason, we can't compare the records. And uh, we want to have a global picture of, of how the climate variations have been, because that's the way to understand the cause of them, to have data from more than one spot. So we've had a lot of, of, of dating uh, initiatives in our program, and I know it's not very sexy, uh, but on the other hand, it is really important if we are to understand uh, what's going on. So um, this is about the abrupt changes, and I haven't got an example from that, but I'll, I'll, but I'll talk a little more about that later. Okay, now we stopped it. So uh, one thing that's an uh, important uh, source of, of changes in the future is, of course, the, the greenhouse gases. And uh, when we look uh, back in time, uh, we can see how the greenhouse gases have changed during glacial and interglacial cycles, and we can investigate how was the levels of the greenhouse gases in the previous interglacial, the EMEA, 120,000 years ago, that we know was warmer than now. I think a good example of the initiatives here is the fact that we have uh, developed new laser-based uh, instrument to measure the greenhouse gases. In this case, it's a, it's a methane record that's been detected on, on the, the, the new ice core from Greenland, the name record. And instead of, of, of having a lot of labs working for many years to detect a record, we now do it online by simply melting ice in the field. And uh, when the ice melts, the air bubbles are released and these air bubbles are taken into uh, laser-based instruments where we measure the, the concentrations of greenhouse gases on the spot. Um, this method is very promising, and the first results are coming out now. I don't think any of them are published yet. And uh, it will give us ability to measure the greenhouse gases in a much higher resolution than has done before. And of course, that gives us the possibility of understanding it and modeling it much better. A third target is the risk of uh, the collapse of the big ice sheets. If we have big changes of uh, ice volume in the past and in the future, this will mean big and, and sudden changes of sea level, which I think is one of the risks we really have into our future. So again, we go back to the past uh, warm periods and look at the risk of abrupt changes during these periods here. For this, um, 
A study has been made by, by Sarah Bradley and uh, Valérie Masson, who's with us today, um, where they take the ice core data from Antarctica and try to interpret them, and um, with the with the you know with the, the mind frame on what if these records were caused by in a situation where West Antarctica had a collapse, where there was missing ice in West Antarctica, because West Antarctica is is uh, one of our, our worries when we have to talk about uh, sea level rise in the future, because the Western Arctic ice sheet has a bedrock that's one and a half kilometer under the present sea level. So if you if you warm and thin the ice sheet, you might get into the situation that the ice decides to pop up and flow like a cork on the water instead of standing on the bed as an ice sheet. And of course, that would give a quite certain sea level rise, uh, which uh, would be what we call an abrupt change um, in the past and perhaps in the future. It is known that this has happened in the past. It's still uncertain if it has happened during the last interglacial 120,000 years ago. Uh, but there, there are more and more things that point towards it actually did happen in this period where the temperatures were globally two degrees warmer. And two degrees warmer, that is uh, exactly what we're expecting within the next 100 years, two degrees or more globally warming. But of course, ice doesn't melt immediately. It does take time for ice to melt. So I'm not suggesting that we'll have a collapse of the West Antarctic ice sheet in 100 years. A last thing um, that can make an abrupt change and change our climate dramatically is changes in the ocean circulations. And uh, there's a lot of discussion now. If there's been a change of the, the North Atlantic uh, uh, circulation here, um, and one of the ways to study it is again to look at the past. And here's a study by Eirik Gallason. In this case, it's in the Eirik Strait, which I think is quite funny that Eirik is working in the Eirik Strait. And uh, it's a quite complicated plot, but uh, the main it's a plot of uh, parameters during the last integration from 128 to 116,000 years ago. And the bottom curve here is a count of the ice rafted debris um, in 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 the ice core in the in the marine core, uh, because uh, it it tells us if if there's been a lot of icebergs, a lot of ice coming out from the ice sheets, and in this uh, climatic climatically warm period, 126,000 years ago, when the temperatures probably were two degrees warmer, five degrees warmer in this area here, we actually see a lot of ice drafted debris. And it's combined with other parameters that show that there's been a change of the North Atlantic circulation in this period. So these data do point towards the possibility of changes if we warm the temperatures globally two degrees. That was kind of a, a summary of some of the results we've had. And if you ask me the importance of that, um, I will repeat myself and say that the, the things I have mentioned are the things that I, we see as the most uh, risky things in the future uh, for abrupt changes. A reduction of the thermal highland circulation uh, caused by melting and, uh, and of, of water in the, in the north. This would cool, cool the north and warm the south if we get a change of the thermal highline circulation. We could risk the abrupt change uh, due to a, a collapse of the western Arctic ice sheet, and uh, this would give a sea level rise of three meters over a century, is the best estimate. And the, the, the thing that we're doing now with the very abrupt changes of the greenhouse gases going into a climate regime that we don't know very well is certainly a risk for in, you know, getting abrupt changes. And my final words would be to say that, uh, that um, when you look at the models that have been used in the IPCC report to, to date uh, and to talk about what's happening in the future, none of them really address abrupt changes. So it's not really included in the models um, of our future, the risk of abrupt changes. And the risk might be small, but the consequences is, are big. So I think it's important that we work more on these things to understand what's happening in the future. Many of the results uh, we have have been published in the more popular pages volume, um, which can be downloaded uh, from the pages homepage. It's very uh, easily um, kind of written in a, in a good language uh, reports. And we also have a homepage for Past for Future uh, where you can find our publications and, and see all the scientists that are involved. So thank you very much.
this one. Yeah. Yes. So good afternoon, everyone. I will um, present you a work that is focused on the climatic uh, changes in polar and subpolar region during the last interglacial. So it's a work that I've led at the British Antarctic Survey, but it really results from a strong collaboration uh, with colleagues from uh, several uh, institutes that are involved in the Path for Future project. And it's also work that has been uh, funded by the UK Natural Environment Research Council through a project named uh, Eyeglass that also aimed at reconstructing climatic variation during past interglacial. So to summarize what we have been uh, doing, we basically have been producing a data synthesis of existing paleoclimatic records that cover the last interglacial that has been mentioned previously, so a warm time period that started about 129,000 years ago. And what it enabled us uh, to do is, for the first time, we can see both in space and in time um, the picture, the evolution of the climatic changes in the high uh, latitude region across uh, this uh, time uh, period, both uh, above uh, Greenland and Antarctica, and also what is happening at the surface of the ocean in those high latitude regions. So it, it basically provides some uh, useful constraint for the climate scientists who test Earth, science, uh, Earth system models that are used for future climate and sea level prediction. So how we, we did that, we basically gathered existing temperature uh, records that already existed from ice cores and marine sediment core that have been retrieved at more than 40 different locations in the polar and in the subpolar regions. And, and the big challenge that we had in this work, and it's something that Dota already mentioned, is that we had to find a strategy to put the records onto a common uh, chronology, which was not easy because those records come from different archives that are located in different hemispheres, for instance. And we really need this common chronology if we want to compare precisely. And when I say precisely, I mean a few thousand of years, the climatic variation from one site to the other across the last uh, interglacial. So, so again, why it is of particular interest to study uh, the last uh, interglacial? It is the best do documented past warm time period that we have in paleoclimatic uh, archives. And also it appears to have been warmer than the current uh, interglacial. And it is something that you can see here on this graph that represents uh, the Antarctic surface temperature evolution over the last 140,000 years. So you have the time going from the right to the left. And you can see that uh, above Antarctica, air temperature was warmer during the last interglacial compared to the current interglacial that you have uh, here. So studying the last interglacial and, and the climatic evolution during this time period really provide an opportunity to assess the effect of warmer than present day climate on the polar ice sheets. And that's also why we have been uh, focusing our work on the polar and the subpolar regions, because we really wanted to get uh, to, to, to be able to describe the climatic context that was responsible for the melting of Greenland and Antarctica uh, at that time. And so such a, a data synthesis uh, could enable to force the model which predict how the melting of the ice sheet contributed to, uh, to the sea level rise. And in a more general picture, global picture, it, it helps assessing the likely contribution of ice volume to, to future sea level scenarios. So, what we've been producing from, from this data synthesis, we've been able to build some time slices. So you have basically time slices at four specific ages that cover from the beginning to the end of the last interglacial. So from 130,000 years to 115,000 years. Um, on each of these time slices, you have the top panels that represent the northern hemisphere. So you have a climatic evolution, of the, in the northern hemisphere in the top panels, and the bottom panels represent the evolution of the southern uh, hemisphere. And if we take one, one time slice, you have those different dots that you can see. Basically, each dot represents one location where we had a climatic uh, information. If the dot is red, it means that at that time, temp surface temperature were warmer uh, than uh, present day. And if 
the dot is blue, it means that surface temperature were colder than present day. And so we basically have been drawing those temperature anomaly between the climate as a specific age and the, the present day condition. So the, the size of the dot will depend on the amplitude of this uh, temperature anomaly between the climate at that time and the present day uh, condition. And so we can see interesting features from those four uh, time slices. For instance, we can see that climatic changes do not occur at the same time in uh, the two hemispheres and with the same amplitude. And we, for instance, we can look at the beginning of the last interglacial at 130,000 years. And you can see that it was already warmer than uh, today in the southern hemisphere, while it was, was still much colder than uh, today in uh, the northern hemisphere. But then, with the 120,000 years and 125,000 years time slice, we can see that indeed in both hemispheres, surface temperature were warmer by about a few degrees in both uh, hemispheres during this time uh, period. So what is interesting as well with those uh, time slices that we have produced is that we can use them to test the capability of the climate models to uh, reproduce the climatic variation during the last interglacial uh, period, which is interesting because we also use those same models, well, climate mod modelers use those same models to do as well future climate prediction. So here we've been doing a, a model data comparison uh, for the time 125,000 years. And what you have here basically is that you have the reconstructed temperature, which are the different dots that are superimposed onto a simulated temperature from a climate uh, model, which is the, the background uh, colored. And so what we can see that at 125,000 uh, years, the climate uh, simulation is able to reproduce the warmer than present day uh, condition in the air temperature above Antarctica with the lower panel, and also the sea surface temperature warmer than today in, uh, in the North Atlantic region. Um, so really, um, to, to finish, th this work really illustrates, I think, uh, what Path for Future was aiming for is that, that both the model and the data community are needs to work uh, together and have been working together to use the past to help improving the estimates about the future. And before finishing, I'd just like you to keep in mind the fact that those results are not published yet, but they are in a paper that is currently under revision. So thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, does anyone have any questions? I'll just remind those watching remotely that they can ask questions by adding egu.media on Skype or by using the hashtag AskEGU on Twitter. And if anyone has questions here in the room, please go ahead and I'll pass along the microphone. Um, Jonathan Amos, BBC. Uh, Thomas, can you talk more about this um, local ice lake drainage? event that you see in the core. Um, my, my knowledge of the geography in the Baltic Sea is, is not great, so if you could tell me where exactly you saw this and the time period uh, as well. Are you able to, to say yet, um, you know, roughly where in that, that core record um, this, this event occurred? Yeah, sure. Uh, <coughs> Do you want to put the map here? Yes, put the map up, please. Uh, the core was from uh, the Danish water, the Lillebelt area. Uh, can I have the pointer, please? Here. Yeah, it's down there. Yes. And without any further knowledge, I guess that that area was a local ice lake dammed by emerging land and blocks of ice. And, uh, well, now I'm guessing... Uh, when a block of ice melts, it opens a passage and the lake is drained down to a certain level. Obviously to a level that was above the sea level at the time. Otherwise, you wouldn't have this sand layer and the hiatus, the sediments missing. So it didn't become a lake until the sea level rose and the sea water could enter, enter that basin. talking about? Uh, well, roughly 13, 14,000 years ago. Okay. That's a good guess. Yeah, yeah. If you want to know anything more about 
ice lake, we have this famous Baltic ice lake that was dammed in the southern part of the Baltic Sea and drained uh, when the ice margin left the mountain in the south central Sweden. And uh, it was something that occurred during perhaps one or two years and almost 8,000 cubic kilometers of water went out into the North Atlantic. But according to the records and the correlation between the VAD record from the Baltic Sea and the ice core record that occurred during the global warming, the end of that ice age, it didn't do much to the North Atlantic circulation. Uh, but if you want to have an estimate of how much 8,000 cubic kilometers of water is, it's a, a, close to a third of the amount of water in the Baltic Basin today. That's a lot of water. <laughs>